uh, with an apology. But um, yeah, I've got a I've got a uh, meeting at the top of the hour um, that came up uh, 24 hours ago that I have to run to. So what I've done, I've put together a presentation. It's really three individual modules. And so what we'll do today is cover off on this first module. And what I'll do uh, then, I think it's gonna be the 9th of March um, is when we'll do some follow-up. So um, I'll just ask everybody to kind of note their questions and hold them as we get through this. And uh, yeah, we'll just, um, we'll dive in, but um, know that one of the things I wanted to do is make sure that you've got access to this material. Um, so you don't really need to take a lot of notes. Once we get through these modules, you'll be able to reference this. I'll make sure it's over to you. And uh, yeah, so uh, about five minutes before the top of the hour, we'll wrap this one up. Um, can everybody see my screen? Any, if I could just get a, uh, yeah, positive. Everyone can see the screen. All good. Fantastic, excellent. Well, again, thank you for being here. Um, the, what I did was take the theme of the coaches conference and kind of flip this model. So uh, resilience, relevance, and adaptation, I've kind of leaned into them and said, you know, I'm gonna flip this around a little bit. And so the first section is what we're going to focus on today, and it's modeling success. And it really takes a sports science approach and mindset to baseball and softball conditioning. And coming from Australia to the United States, that was one of the most remarkable things I saw was a pretty old school strength and conditioning approach to our sport. Um, I'm going to talk a lot about asymmetry in this module. And if you can imagine strength and conditioning a coach is applying bilateral loading techniques to an asymmetrical structure, we actually end up exacerbating concerns with the musculoskeletal system. So we're gonna dive in and talk a little bit around this, but we've got to start somewhere, starting with resilience. And I'm gonna start with this quote, and a good buddy of mine, you may have seen this used a number of times in the last few years, um, the best ability is availability. And what we're talking about here is, is reduction of injury. A buddy of mine by the name of Tom Haberstro from ESPN was the first one to coin this term after a discussion we had uh, around trying to pull injuries back and the role and responsibility of strength and conditioning coaches to actually condition against injury. And we're gonna talk about that a fair bit this morning. Here's the big problem. And it's a massive problem in Major League Baseball uh, is injury. These numbers from 2016 were the first ones that really were really published in full. The amount of players that were injured uh, during the course of a season uh, on the roster and the cost of those players in 2016. Well, what's happened in the last five years? Salaries have gone up. Guess what else has gone up? Injuries. It's absolutely staggering. So in 2021, these were the two worst teams in Major League Baseball based upon injury. And when we're talking about injury, we really use the statistic, man games lost. If you're interested in this topic, there's actually a website called Man Games Lost that you can tap into and subscribe to and get a fair bit of information. My source for all this data is a guy by the name of Will Carroll, um, who's an injury expert in the United States, covers both baseball and football primarily baseball, and we talk about this stuff all the time. He gave me some numbers and gave me these very average quantifications of uh, cost for the New York Mets of 2,264 man games lost. Um, if that was just based upon the average $4.5 million Major League Baseball player salary, it'd be nearly $69 million that's basically thrown into a dumpster and burned. Same with the San Diego Padres. Now, those average numbers are significantly exacerbated in these two groups. The Mets lost uh, Jacob deGrom, um, who's a, if you know, his salary is stunning. Same with the $300 million that um, Fernando Tatis is being paid with the San Diego Padres. I mean, there is a significant cost for injury, and it's not just financial cost. It is also... Um, man games lost um, is also directly related to uh, wins and losses. And we're going to talk about that a little bit. But the stat I've got on the screen right now may surprise a few people. Uh, in my work over the last 15, 20 years, what we've found is 85% of injuries in baseball. And I believe with the limited exposure I've had over in softball, that it, it's, it's very, very similar. Preventable injuries. These aren't, we're not talking about ballistic injury. We're not talking about impacts in the NFL. 
we're talking about overuse and we're talking about soft tissue injuries such as tendonitis, such as hamstring pulls, such as oblique strains. It frustrates the living shit out of me. And I apologize for my language, but you know how passionate I am about this. It frustrates the hell out of me when I see a hamstring pull or I see an oblique strain because in the last seven years as a practitioner, I haven't had one. And there's ways we can offset around this. Injuries cost teams wins. As you look at this graph, and you'll have this to look at later, um, there's a direct correlation here. If you can't practice with the team or formulate strategies with your first ordered team, it's like playing chess with a back row full of pawns. You know, you key players that are invested in so heavily, they're a part of the tactical and strategic use day in and day out by teams. So we know there's a direct correlation. If we use the statistic wins above replacement player, and when a primary player like a Tatis or a DeGrom goes down, who replaces them? What is the cost of injury? Like those costs I outlined were simply salary costs. If you ask Major League Baseball the cost of injury, they'll say, yeah, road ticket sales, jersey sales. They'll accelerate that number significantly. So bottom line here, there's a big cost with injury. If you know anything about sports science or you've followed any kind of models, the Australian Institute of Sport were one of the first and very rapidly at the same time, the English Institute of Sport actually developed some significant sports science models that are, have been applied across many sports, but very limited in baseball. And that's, like I said, when I first got to the US, was hard to see a scientific approach to the way they were conditioning the athletes. I've always stated there's two laws in sports science. The first law, is prevent injury. The second law is to optimize performance. But law two never succeeds law one. That is kind of my operating premise. And you'll see how that compounds and works as we get into modules two and three later on. The primary emphasis of any strength and conditioning program needs to be exactly this focus. We're first and foremost gonna make sure that the athletes can sustain the demands, the asymmetrical load demands and force demands of our sport. Really interesting to me when I st first started diving into this, trying to find some empirical research around how injuries were occurring. I actually uh, got to know the TrackMan guys really well and the CEO of that company very well. Um, I actually did some work for them over in Asia, looking at data from TrackMan to, with two different um, Japanese league teams to see if we could figure out was there information contained within their day-to-day -day tracking of athletes that could be used in a biomedical or bioanalytics format. And amazingly, there's been a number of things we've found. But my first dive um, was with a company called Zone 7, which you may be familiar with. Um, they're an artificial intelligence company. Uh, they were Israel-based. I leveraged their CTO, their chief technology officer, and a lot of artificial intelligence and pattern recognition algorithms to dive into this myriad of data that we had for TrackMan. And amazingly, some things started to show up specifically around pitcher injury. Why are we focused on pitchers right now? Well, on a baseball team, they make up 50% of the roster. So they are the predominance of the athletes. And they are the ones that are constantly moving and co we constantly understand whether it's by current technology or through pitch count, we understand kind of the broad general demands that are going to be placed on them. But when you dive in and look at the granularity of this data coming off track, man, it was stunning. Every injury we saw, one of four conditions uh, were prevalent there. And here's what those four are. Overuse was number one. And that's kind of defined by any load above normal, historical, sustainable levels. So if a pitcher is normally a 75 pitch guy as a starting pitcher, and all of a sudden due to the stress of the game, he's, he's now required to go 105 pitches. Um, that was a key flag and a key risk indicator for injury. Actually, number one, overuse. Amazingly, number two, and this kind of stunned me, was underuse. You know, that all of a sudden, you know, if you've got a reliever and they're only throwing 12 pitches a game and they're throwing them every other night, and then all of a sudden they're thrown into a situation that they have to throw more uh, than that, that underuse de-evolved them is really what was happening. So that was a number two cause of injury. 
too much variation, too little variation, right? So when you look at these pathways towards injury based upon this empirical data, here's what we have as practitioners, a really narrow pathway to navigate our way down to create adaptation and to create sustainability and that resilience factor for our athletes. It's a narrow path. I wanna talk about load and load management because I think it is the most misunderstood and misused term in sports. From 2013 to 2017, I was a senior applied sports scientist for an Australian technology company you may be familiar with called Catapult Sports. We actually defined this algorithm. We came up with this term player load and our competitors uh, from Northern Ireland, Stat Sports, quickly replicated uh, this player load algorithm with something they called dynamic stress load. Don't tell anybody from Catapult this, but I think that dynamic stress load algorithm is a little better than ours. Uh, I think they did a really good job with it. But because of load management and the requirement to manage load in baseball, I've seen teams, and I'll call out one, the Houston Astros, one of my old teams, they went out and they purchased 170 of these GPS-based monitors, worn in compression shirts, put them on their players and started to aggregate data that they said was load data. Well, none of this was applicable to baseball. None of it at all. The question is why? Well, if you look at any of the load algorithms uh, that are derived from these wearable tech companies, they're the majority and the preponderance of them is based around the distance that an athlete runs, the distance they run. These are GPS devices. 95% of Catapult's player load algorithm is based upon what ground you cover. So where's the applicability in baseball? Just because something's termed load doesn't mean it's a contextual, usable application for our sport. So it doesn't work for a pitcher. And here's the other thing you'll run into all the time. You'll hear about it in commentary. You'll hear about it um, walking into any major league clubhouse. There's some magic number someone pulled out of, I'll use the sky instead of another area I was going to go to. They pulled this out of nowhere. 100 pitches. Oh, he's crossed the 100 pitch mark. What does that mean? Well, it means a lot if you're only used to pitching 80, throwing 85 pitches, but it doesn't mean much if you're used to throwing uh, 125 pitches. When I was with the Houston Astros, um, getting a pitcher through to an adaptive kind of process and understanding that and titrating load volumes, I'll never forget, was actually the first time I met a prominent Astro, Nolan Ryan. I'm walking down a tunnel at Minute Maid Park and I was introduced to him and I said, oh, Mr. Ryan, I said, I'd love to sit down and talk to you at some point about pitch counts and how to modify pitch counts. I nearly got my head ripped off. Because he turned around and said, oh, you damn you know, scientist, you think you know everything, damn pitch counts, blah, blah, blah. And what he didn't know was that was actually on his side. I don't think we should be limiting pitches. I think we should be pushing them out and improving their ability to adapt to higher volumes. If we're going to spend $300 million on a pitcher, uh, I want him to start 30 to 35 games that year. I want him to go deep into each one of those games. That is going to be a critical element here. So this 100 pitch number for load, throw it away. It's meaningless. So how do we define load? How do we look at load for a pitcher? I was called into the New York Mets at one point in time to look at their pitcher reports. This was actually 2017. And all they had was innings pitched. That's what they were going to use as a load marker for that season for pitchers. I said, we can do better than that. Let's go to pitch count. But what I actually found through leveraging the TrackMan data was load variability not only comes from the amount of pitches thrown, but the type of pitch thrown. In 2017, I was, uh, I was working with the Los Angeles Dodgers with their R&D department. And you know, I always have questions and I like to talk to the players because I was getting some really good feedback from them. So I had this discussion. Uh, Grinky was there at the time with Clayton Kershaw. Brandon McCarthy was another pitcher you may have heard of who was getting a Tommy John uh, rehab at the time. And I went up to Clayton and the other pitchers were there. And I said, guys, I said, look, I said, I've got a question. If you throw 100 pitches in one game and 100 pitches in the next game, can they fatigue you differently? And this is when Kershaw leaned in and he goes, absolutely. He goes, if we're playing the Indians and they're, they're uh, at the time, now the, now the Guardians at the time, uh, they had a really heavy right-handed hitting lineup. He goes, that to me is a cutter heavy 
session. I'm going to throw cutters in on the hands of these guys to offset their power. And he goes, and that'll take a lot out of me. I have got to push back a day maybe on my bullpen. So, okay, fantastic. So now I started looking at both velocity and spin rate as indicators of overall load. If I asked you to go to the gym, like my mate here, Cam, if I asked you to go to the gym and I said, buddy, I said, I want you to do three sets of 10 of a bench press. First thing you'd look at me and say, well, how much weight do I use, right? This is what we're talking about. What's the weight of each pitch? What's the strain of each pitch? And guess what? Each one of them individually has a different level of biomechanical strain. So it's wonderful when I'm sitting at Major League Baseball and I've got every piece of technology known to man from Hawkeye to TrackMan to Kinetrax in the uh, bullpen uh, to wearable technology that's measuring the recovery from those pitches. I've got a ton of stuff that I can look at. But what do you do when you don't have all that tech? This is a model I really like. We developed this uh, about six years ago and it's been used by a number of teams that aren't big in technology. And again, you'll have access to this and I'd love you to use it, trial it, tell me what you think. It's associating strain values to each different pitch. And as you can look at this screen here, what I've done is assign for this individual, a fastball has a weighting of one, change up 1.2, slider 1.3, you can see this through. Cutter is, a, is generally a pitch that puts a lot of elbow and shoulder strain and even torso strain on the athletes from some of the research we've done. So I kind of spread this out and looked at it. And I think the way to do it is to understand the individual arsenal and the pitch distribution of each pitcher and have this conversation with them. Like, what's your hardest pitch to throw? What takes the most out of you? And create a scoring system relative, let's call this not quantitative load, which is pitch count, let's call this qualitative load. And if we know anything about adaptation, it's the qualitative nature of load that enables us to adapt and evolve our pitchers. So what would that look like if we're kind of logging this rate of perceived exertion against this individual pitcher, you can see how that would map out. So from an 87 pitch game, we might get a quantitative or sorry, qualitative score on that pitcher of maybe 101 based upon the distribution weighting of those pitchers. This is the way I like to look at it. The other thing is taking this information and really looking at th through a set of eyes, it's more of a temporal mindset it's like going to the doctor and doing one test of your blood pressure. Well, if you've just had an argument with spouse, you've watched a crappy movie, you're frustrated at work, what do we think that one measure of blood pressure is going to look like, right? We've got to get that set out over time. So if you're looking into the 2022 season and you've got a once a week pitcher based upon your league, let's start to look at those things and understand when, it, when this pitcher presents and he's now scored at 101, as opposed to being his average 84.7 scoring system, we're now at a point of risk. And that to me would indicate there's some potential interventions necessary. More recovery work, more soft tissue work required, whether it's massage, stretch, whatever that potentially may be. This is where we know when to intervene. And guys, it's not just pitch count. There's a hell of a lot more to it. Let's talk about softball for a little bit. So I've done a little bit of work with uh, Arizona State softball team. What I found there was that uh, most loads um, for our female softball pitchers specifically, so much is being driven out of the lower body. Our male baseball pitchers, they have this wonderful, I'm just going to fall down the mound and let it rip, right? Well, we don't have a mound in softball, so where do those forces generate? They have to generate in the lower extremity. So this is an area that I think is probably underlooked at in terms of pitcher fatigue. And so we're aware of this. The real model here is we want to understand fatigue first and foremost. This is why we monitor load. The process is if we have fatigue, the next phase of the equation is compensation. Body's going to go into a compensatory state, change its muscle distribution to still impact the same outcome. If I'm using 102 muscles to throw a 95 mile an hour fastball, as I fatigue, that muscular use is going to change and it's going to be different distributions on the muscular system. When I'm in compensation, I'm literally steps away from injury. And that's why we want to monitor load, offset that fatigue, 
prior to an athlete potentially going into compensation. This area with softball, I think, is underlooked at and or maybe I just haven't seen that information as yet. But with anything, um, I think the very first thing to analyze for your individual athletes, for your teams, for your associations is start to get good injury records and understand the etiology of the injury patterns that are being amassed. If we can pull that down as a starting point, we can then profile around that individual for what injuries may have existed prior. And that's always the very first uh, kind of point of call. What's the injury history of your athlete? One of the things you'll hear a lot with technology companies, et cetera, they're stating, ah, we can predict injury. We can predict injury. Bullshit. Nobody can predict injury. What we can do is show who's at risk of injury. And I think it's models such as load monitoring that provide a fair bit of that. Um, load with position players, very similar. Catchers are pretty resilient. They tend to have the same amounts of loads and it's, it's evenly distributed for the majority of their time behind the dish. They, they seem to be the most resilient of the athletes from soft tissue injury we had, but we still want to monitor their load uh, consistently and continuously. So the biggest question, you know, the $64 question, if these injuries are preventable and 85% of them are preventable, in my opinion, how the hell do you do that? Well, I'm going to tell you a quick personal story. So I was called into a CPBL team in 2016. Uh, the brothers, actually the whole team name is the Brothers Elephants. That's the name of the team. And I love the English translations here of their marketing. Brothers got balls. Um, yeah, somewhat. Um, I don't know what they were referring to here. You see some funny stuff in, uh, in the CPBL. But I was called into this team to eradicate injury. Now, eradicating injury? Yeah, not that easy, right? So I had this thesis back in 2012 that biomechanical asymmetry was a leading cause of soft tissue injury. So I actually deployed that for six months with a trial team in Taiwan. But I realized I didn't have enough data. There wasn't enough technology available. I didn't know how well the athletes were recovering. I didn't have track men in the stadium to really truly monitor load. But I came back in 2016 with a different team and adjusted with the following results. So again, etiology of injury for this organization from 2012 to 2015, they were averaging 32 players, 32 injuries per season, which were over 900 man games lost. And you can figure out that you know, that's a high cost to any team in any sport, especially in a professional league like in Taiwan. Here were the numbers. First year, we got we reduced uh, soft tissue preventable injury by 75%. 75% huge, right? Um, and we'll talk about how that occurred immediately. But you see these numbers. We got to zero soft tissue injuries in 2019. And when I was asked to re-sign a contract and continue on, I was like, I can't beat zero injury. So I'm going to step away now. I kind of uh, took, took a back seat. They've only had one or two injuries with the champions uh, this past season. So they've continued this process fairly well. So I kind of understand that it's the process. It's not me. I'm just the architect. It's the process and it's the people that you employ to really gather around those athletes. So what made the biggest difference? Whoops. I'm sorry. We're going to go back a slide. Bear with me. Um, the biggest difference. Year one, all we did was offset asymmetry. Not only bilateral asymmetry, anterior, posterior asymmetry. We offset those. How did we get a 66% drop in 2018? I hired the best strength coach I could find. who was actually a Taiwanese resident working for the New York Knicks, stole him from the Knicks, took him to Taiwan, took him home and deployed him. Attention to detail was what was missing and a mindset around how to perform each lift how to get buy-in from those athletes. That was something that was incredibly critical that enabled us to get down to zero, zero injuries. Uh, bear with me. I'm sorry, guys. I'm uh, all over the map here with this. Um, asymmetrical offsets. How do we do that? Well, we've got to get our player injury profile, as I stated earlier. We've got to look at both bilateral load volumes, and we can analyze those by position. If you're a left-handed hitting, left-handed throwing outfielder, you turn right for nothing in our sport. Imagine that day in, day out at a major league or at a professional level. The asymmetry is stunning, right? Absolutely stunning in our sport. I've had people say golf is a more asymmetrical sport than baseball, and I disagree. You get to putt at pretty low levels in golf. You don't get that option too often in baseball. 
um, anterior posterior asymmetry. Look at your athletes. I wish we had a switch that we could turn off and say, stop adapting, right? They're hunched over in front of their lockers on their screens. And so there's a whole posterior chain element that is factoring in to this imbalance and in injury. So my first year, and these are sample programs, and a lot of this we do with the Australian national team now, is we offset bilateral asymmetry. We also offset anterior, posterior asymmetry. These are daily events for us traveling with a national team. Dallas Keuchel, who was a Cy Young Award winner who I worked with, uh, with the Houston Astros when he was there, was the first one who really validated for me. Um, he came to me in August and said, you know what? It's August. My body feels so fresh. Um, it's unlike any other season I've had. And I was like, yeah, because we're basically getting your wheel alignment correct so that you can go out each day and, um, and produce force. So guys, I'm going to wrap it here with three minutes left with a summary. Um, injury etiology is critical to know and understand. And as I stated, 85% of our injuries, I believe, are preventable. Not like the NFL, where only 30% of their injuries are soft tissue. The other 70% are pretty ballistic, right? Soccer is interesting. I've been talking to the group at Sunderland uh, very closely uh, recently as well. I've got a good friend there. Non-contact ACL injuries is, is a problem we're trying to solve right now. And we're looking at various training applications and elements for them that hopefully will get them out of this League One, bump them back up to the EPL. We don't know. Um, load management, understand it model against it, realize what we have to do. And then if you want to look at one thing because you've got a spate of injuries, it's asymmetry. Purely start there. Understand gravity's constant. The human body was designed to biolocomote through a gravitational field. This is how we're built. We want to make sure that body is well balanced so we can go out and repeat the activities of force production for our sports daily. I could sit here and talk to you guys all day and I wish I could, um, but I'll pause for a couple of minutes here. And has anyone got um, immediate questions on this that I might be able to answer in the waning minutes that we have? I'm sure there will be, Gary. Um, <laughs> no worries at all. I'd encourage everyone to use the chat function as well, because I know there's uh, future sessions coming up in... Um, yeah. Uh, in March time, or we can pick up uh, in sections two and three of your or your presentation as well, if that's okay. Sure, absolutely. And I'll send over kind of some outlines of the next two sessions. Um, if you have individual needs, reach out to me as well. Like I work with youth athletes and I'm primarily focused on softball. And this is a problem that we have, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, it's one of those things to let me know. Um, and maybe I, what I can do is uh, get some very direct information in one or two of these next sessions. But guys, I can't thank you enough. I can't thank you enough for um, having me on and uh, also your flexibility with timing. Hopefully I've opened up everybody's next hour to go and grab a beer or have dinner or be with family or maybe go back out to practice. Gary, thanks for taking the time tonight. I appreciate your schedule's been uh, thrown around at very short notice. So it's really appreciated that you managed to still find time to speak with us tonight, even on a foreshortened session. Uh, and really looking forward to the future sessions uh, in March when you're able to rejoin us again. Uh, hope everything Love goes it. well and speak to you soon. Love it, guys. Thank you so much. Have a great day. Thanks, Gary. Uh, before we conclude, I just want to check if there's any further questions that we can collate um, and send through to Gary ahead of sessions two and three so that we can preempt anything that wants to, to come out from there. Um, so if there is, then please let us know either on the chat or through to email to either Colin or, or, or I. Um, Colin, just quickly, is there anything um, to add on to anything I've just said before we close up? Um, yeah, Chris, I see there's a couple of things popping into to the chat group. Um, as Chris has mentioned, if uh, on your joining your login details that you got from us, my email address is at the bottom. Um, if, you, if you want to get a response from, from Gary a lot earlier, as opposed to waiting till the end of March, uh, please let me know. Uh, Chad, I have picked up yours. Yes, I'll get your stuff going across as I know who you are and, and where you're coming from. Uh, anybody else that's looking for stuff, please, please feel free to, to email it to me and we'll get there. So letting you know what it's all about is 
Gary's put something together called relevance and adaptation going forward for the next couple of um, the 9th of March, actually, where he's going to come in for a full hour and a half and break that down into another two sections, as he has put it. Um, that's what he's put it over to me. Uh, he's doing maximum strength. He's doing ability, uh, which is just done there. Sorry, maximum strength. There we go. KPRs, season review of training, um, roster programs, how to succeed professionally. So he's got a vast understanding of the games, baseball and softball. He's traveled the world. Um, so from that aspect, please, I urge you to rejoin us on that on the ninth to, come, to carry on and continue this uh, chat with Gary. Um, and if there are other people out there that you, you're you wanting to come across, please just let them know what's happening and, and get them to, to email me and I'll be able to get them online. Um, anything else from anybody else? Um, I am seeing a couple of things come down on the side there in, in the chat column. Um, but like I say, just so you want to get an answer directly out of Gary, I am more than willing to take your emails and send it to him directly. Great. Thanks, Colin. Uh, just a reminder, the next session in this uh, series of Coach Summit um, webinars is on Thursday, the 10th of uh, February, uh, where, to which point uh, John Skaggs will be joining us. Um, to talk about infield and outfield uh, presentation. I think he's with us for a couple of weeks. So a uh, reminder, the next session is on Thursday, the 10th, 7.30, uh, and that will hopefully go through till nine o'clock. Apologies again for the slightly foreshortened session where we took a decision that actually having some of Gary tonight is better than having none of Gary tonight, um, appreciating his uh, meetings that have been arranged at short notice. So thanks again for joining tonight. Enjoy the rest of your evenings and we'll catch up soon. Many thanks.